Hi, Mick. Thanks for coming. It's great to have you here. Good to be here, Hayley. Really. Now, you. I read recently that you grew up in a music um, love and family, so I was just kind of wondering what artists did you mainly listen to when you were growing up? Well, um, I grew up in a music loving family, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, there weren't anyone who played instruments in our family, okay. right? My dad sang, and that would be, he would have been the most influential mm -hmm. musical uh, uh, memory that I have. Mm -hmm. No, but he had a different repertoire to what I ended up doing, obviously, as it was. He, he listened to John McCormick and all that kind of oh, stuff, okay. you know. And he, he, but m most of my influences, early influences, would have come from radio. Uh, because we listened to radio an awful lot. I mean, I was born in 1949, that's a long time ago. And for those, you know, to the 50s and 60s, those early influences would have been, uh, a lot would have come from the radio. And I remember songs like that. Uh, like Johnny Ray, early Johnny Ray. And then I suppose the biggest thing that happened was the arrival of Elvis Presley yeah, and the Beatles course, yeah. in uh, 19... 62. Mm -hmm. I would have been in uh, Intersart maybe mm -hmm. at that time. And uh, uh, I, like the first, the first piece of music, if you like, that I ever remember making an impact on me was an instrumental piece of music by the Shadows, who were a backing band for a guy called Cliff Richard, who's still playing yeah. actually. <laughs> And he heard it on the radio being advertised today. Anyway, uh, they, they had a, a tune called Apache. And I, I, there was something about the sound of that guitar yeah. that really flew my head away. So I wanted to make that sound. And I persuaded my dad to buy me a guitar for the princely song of two pounds, ten shillings at the time. And of course, when I played it, and I, when I learned how to make any kind of a sound at all, it didn't sound a bit like the shadows, that's yeah. for sure. So I had a long way to go, and uh, but the Beatles were a, a seminal influence on me. Mm -hmm. They were a, a really, uh, gr the ground shifted when the Beatles arrived, and coincidentally in America at the same time, Bob Dylan appeared. Yeah. And um, so there was a huge amount, of, like the, the mystique of songwriting, for example, at the time, I mean, I never dreamt it for one moment that I could actually attempt to write anything. I mean, I didn't, my, I didn't have the, my parents wouldn't have been into that or, you know, they were, I wouldn't have thought it possible. But when I heard that the Beatles were writing songs, I thought, I st there was still a certain mystique about it. But I thought, well, maybe if they can do it, you know, I mean, their background is a bit similar to mine, mm. etc. So that opened up, they, the, the Beatles and all of that beat scene in, uh, from Liverpool, mm -hmm which is now 40 years old, 50 years old at this stage. That was a big influence on yeah. me. But uh, yeah, that, that, those would have been my early influences, yeah. You said it was around the intercert kind of that you heard mm. that. I actually read that um, at a school performance you played Twist and Shout. I did. And you got in a bit of trouble <laughs> oh, for it. Oh dear, where did you read that? I, 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 wonder, I didn't know anybody knew that. <laughs> That's true, I did. Um, uh, there was a, a brother uh, who was the superior at the time in CBSX in Street and Limerick, and he was, uh, he allowed us to play. We were a three-piece band. Yeah. One, uh, the drummer was a guy called Don O'Connor, who went on to form a band himself, and I can't remember the name of them now. Willie didn't ever pursue the music, but I did. Mm -hmm. And the three of us went on and we, we, we begged, could, we begged our, our way on to the actual uh, bill for the school concert. And uh, he said, well, what are you going to sing? And I said, well, we were singing some Beatles songs like Twist and Sir Assey. He said, no, you can't sing that. And I said, why not? I said, that's, that's only noise. So I said, well, what do you want me to sing? So he, he came up with, uh, uh, what was it? Don't Fence Me In, or some song like that, you know, some old Bing Crosby number, which we were very good, we thought wasn't very cool. So to, we went down that night and actually did it in spite of him, and he didn't like it at all. He didn't trust me from there on. I can imagine. <laughs> but it went down the storm, you see. This, yeah. is, this is the problem. Uh, the, the, the song uh, and our performance of it went down like they just, I, we were so young and we were so unafraid. Yeah. It's a great thing. It's a great thing. No nerves. Just go out and, yeah. and uh, make <laughs> a fool of yourself. <laughs> so we did that, and uh, it was great success. Yeah. Um, was there any kind of 
moment that changed you more so from rock and roll to kind of Irish, more traditional music, or did it just happen? There was a few things. Um, a, a, a guy introduced me to the work of Woody Guthrie. Mm -hmm. And that was, he was an American folk singer, very influential protest singer. Very influential, uh, it would have been a big influence on Bob Dylan, it would have been a big influence on, uh, you know, that whole folk scene that was happening in Greenwich Village at the time. And I heard his music for the first time, Danny Murphy was the guy that introduced me to him, and Huddy Ledbetter, who was known as Lead Belly, and he played a 12-string guitar. Mm. So all of these sounds were opening up, but what I loved about the, the if you like the difference between that kind of music and what about the Beatles, the early Beatles music, was this this music had a story. Yeah. You know? Mm -hmm. There were big stories and I loved that. And I've never lost my love for that kind of song. Mm -hmm. So that that would have been a huge influence at the time. Um and that steered me in the direction of the folk music. Mm -hmm. So I became a folk singer as it were. But I knew nothing about Irish music at all. There was yeah. no no Irish music in the house. There was nobody played an instrument. And only, you know, next door, the county, I was born in Limerick, and the county next door was alive with, with, uh, with uh, Irish music, traditional Irish mm. music, you know, County Clare was, was buzzing with it at the time. Mm. Uh, but in, in actual fact, the, the, the thing about Irish music was, it, it was, it was peasant music, mm. you know, and people were trying to modernise themselves. So it didn't have a good press mm. until really Sean O'Leada and Planksty came along. And that that made it cool again. You know? yeah. So um, I met. A, I was very lucky to meet a guy um, uh, from Donegal called Mihal O'Donnell. And Mihal uh, had a wonderful collection of songs. He was a native Irish speaker, and his dad was a collector. And he became a collector himself. He went to to Trinity, I think, or UCD, one of the colleges, and anyway, and he, that was his Irish folklore was his subject. Yeah. So he was a huge influence on me. Michal was a huge influence on me. And uh, I, yeah, that's how I learned about Irish music. I knew nothing about it before then. Mm. So he opened up and, and further, he also played guitar. And I didn't know how you actually brought guitar to uh, Irish folk music. How could you do it? Mm. Like everyone played flutes and fiddles and mandolins. Mm. There was no space for you, you know? But Michal suddenly uh, provided me with that opportunity and taught me a lot. So those were two, they were, that was a very influential period, yeah. that, that period. And then, you know, I, I did folk music, I recorded, I recorded an album with Michal uh, when I was in my, when I was 20. The two of us were very young at the time. And we, for Polydor. And um, then uh, I, we went to France for a couple of, you know, for a summer. And we played music there in Brittany and uh, he came back home and I stayed in France. I was just overwhelmed by the beauty of the place. I loved it, I loved mm -hmm. France. And uh, I stayed there for two years mm -hmm. and played music. Well, I played music off and on. Uh, when Michal went home, we were known as Monroe. And when Michal went home, I had to start under the name Mick Hanley again, whom nobody knew, you know. So I had to start at the very bottom. And I didn't uh, make any... Uh, I didn't make any progress with the music, so I had to work on the ships there in a place called Duanani. But I loved it. I, 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 that was a great, great, suddenly liberating thing, yeah. you know, to be away from, be away from Catholic Ireland. Let's yeah. face it, you know, at the time, which was very repressive, suddenly into a very, very liberated society, mm. comparatively. Yeah, they were Catholic too, but they were, they were a little <laughs> bit loose, looser, you know, than we were. Um, you mentioned earlier about the kind of storytelling quality of um, traditional Irish music. Mm -hmm. What song of your own would you say is maybe your favourite lyrics that you've ever written? Oh, oh, well, well, well. Um, well, I think um, there's a story that I love, um, which I wrote. Uh, it's a true story mm -hmm. about, I suppose, about uh, my parents wanting me to when I left school. They, they wanted me to, you know, to have a decent job, and uh, like all parents do, and uh, a secure, the security of it. And they knew the music was a bit, a bit iffy mm -hmm. as a career. And it is, it's a bit, you know, it doesn't very little security involved in music unless you make it big. 
And even then, people are very vulnerable because uh, the whole, the things that buoy you up can be taken from you very quickly if you're not actually delivering the goods, you know. Uh, so they were they were quite disappointed when I mean I'd worked in the ESB as a as a in an office for mm -hmm. two years, and uh, I was mad for the music you know and I was playing in Galway with different musicians etc etc, so I, I actually left I actually left and I handed in my notice and gave up this wonderful job that I have a pension and all that stuff with now I you, see there have been their pensions have been rifled at this very moment we speak, but anyway. Um, I left and uh, I came home and told them, look, I've handed in my notice. Of course, they were terribly shocked. They were asking me, what will I do, you know? Mm. I said, well, I'm, hey, I'm going to become a professional musician. Isn't it exciting? My mother said, no, what, are you, what will you work at? <laughs> so the work and the professional musicians didn't tie in. So I was dying for something to happen. Yeah. Right. That would, would uh, reassure them that... Uh, I had made the right decision, but not never did. And then they died very close to each other, about 10 weeks. And about six months later, Hal Ketchum went into the American charts of one of my songs, mm -hmm. which turned my life upside yeah. down. But the people I wanted to tell were gone. Mm -hmm. So I sat down about a year later and I wrote them a song. Um, with I'd met somebody new with a baby. So I had a couple of good news stories for a change. Yeah. You know, usually it was a poverty-stricken story. Mm -hmm. But now there was something positive and there was, there was money coming in, etc., etc. But they were gone. So I sat down and wrote them a song called I Feel I Should Be Calling You. Do you want me to play a bit of it? I do, yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. So, yeah, and I, I just told them, I told them the news as it were, you know? And uh, I sent it off up into the ether. Now, I don't know whether they got the message or not. None of us ever know these things. Um, but it just struck me the other day that it mightn't be too long before I find out. <laughs> We're getting into that area. <laughs> I don't want an impression. This is the song. Uh, like, I got the feeling all the time that I wanted to tell them this. And I like almost there'd be a momentary thing when I'd have forgotten that my mother was actually passed on. So I'd be reaching for the phone. Yeah. Say, I must tell them this, you know. Someone 
racing up the charts Now that would have gladdened both your hearts Up the pike, see all of us Sure every day is like Christmas So we threw a party, we hit the juice You know the form, the least excuse It's sitting now at number two That might be. That'll give you an idea of the two, the two uh, verses that I wrote to tell the story. The funny thing was, Haley, that uh, the song "Past the Point of Rescue" mm. never made it to number one. No, they had all the designs. Like I mean, they're very careful about these things, and they plan it very well. And they had every plan made to make sure that this song made it to number one. And for some reason, it only got to number two. <laughs> right, um, but. In 1992, it was the most played country song in America, so which was something. But, uh, as I say, it only went to number two, and the line is, um, it's sitting now at number two, and I feel I should be calling you. Now, if it went to number one, I would never <laughs> have had that line, so I thought that was nice. That's you know, nice. Yeah. Um, when you're writing your lyrics, like, do you have a certain writing process, or does it just kind of come organically to you? Wow. <sighs> well, it's very difficult to explain that the blank page every morning or not every morning but um, most of the time you're looking at a songwriter particularly novelist I envy novelists sometimes because they have a plan for a couple of years you know songwriters don't have that um, in a way they really are uh, the, the song format is quite short you know you might have three verses and a chorus Three verses, two choruses. Once you have a verse and a chorus, the real uh, foundation work, which is the most of the song, is actually done. Mm. So you're looking at really uh, uh, more delicate work after that. You know, yeah. the real graft is build, getting your foundation together, getting your your verse, your chorus, your little bits and pieces, whatever, in your your melody line. Um, sorry, I've lost your question. What was it again? Do you have a certain writing process? Oh yeah, well, I, the certain writing process is sitting down and doing it. Yeah. That's the process. Just sit there, get it, take your instrument, and whatever whatever way it makes it happen for you, uh, whether it be strumming or just doodling away. Doodling is a good way to get started, yeah. you know. Um, there is no cut and dried rule, mm. and uh, for everyone it's different. Um, and the the more the, actually. If you can break the rules, that's what makes your song quite different. And the prime example of that is a, is a singer that's dead now called Roy Orbison. Roy Orbison broke the rules left, right and centre because he had this extraordinary voice. Uh, and he wrote for his voice more than anything. But they were very evocative songs mm -hmm. and he, he never stuck to a rule. In Dreams is one of his big hits that has no chorus at all. Nothing. Yeah. It just, it starts, it's just, you could say it's one big chorus or one big verse, you know. Yeah. So, um, uh, for everybody it's different uh, and for everybody has different way. I like to try and check in, uh, you know, most days if mm -hmm. I'm not, uh, and, and at least spend my morning trying for a, an idea yeah. or a new song or working on the one I started yesterday. Um, I, I started a song yesterday, I was doing it this morning before I came here, and it is so dark, it brought me out of So I was glad to get out here and <laughs> talk to you. <laughs> so I don't know what, what way that song is going to end up, but it's not looking very uh, joyful. Yeah. But you have to write the sad ones too. Absolutely. You know. um, speaking of your lyrics actually, mm. Gareth Brooks said of you that his songs are real, they mean something. He's one of the best songwriters around at the moment. My, so my, how my, did you my, my. feel when you heard that? Uh, well, that's that's very flattering, isn't mm. it? Yeah, of course he's right. <laughs> 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 nah, well, I mean, you know, I don't know. I don't think Garth was very aware of other songwriters in Ireland at the time, and because I did the hit with uh, with uh, Hal Ketchum and uh, "Past the Point of Rescue" is an interesting song. Mm. 
because country people don't write those kind of lyrics. So Gart was, um, you know, immediately kind of said to himself, Jesus, this is strange. And it was strange that it happened because I didn't write it uh, past the point of rescue as a country song at all. Mm. I wrote it as a kind of, um, what would I call it? It's a, like a, a gentle rock song in a way. But the minute they got their hands on it, they, they made a country song of it. Mm. But I, I was very surprised, very surprised that they actually went for a lyric that vague. Mm -hmm. They were very careful about what they write in Nashville. Most of it is rubbish, but 10% but of it is really, really good. Yeah. Simplicity, you know. Yeah. So, yeah, they're all, all those things help. Yeah, you know, absolutely. They're, they're not money, but they can help you make it. <laughs> um, at one point as well, you actually uh, took over for Christy Moore in mm. Moving Hearts. How That's did that right. come about? How did it come about? Well, before Moving Hearts was ever formed, myself and Declan Simmet, who would be the guitar player with, and who still plays with Christy now, he's his he's, he's side man. Um, myself and Declan played together as a duo. So we never lost touch. And uh, he would be, he became, before he joined uh, with Christy, after, uh, sorry, after he left Moving Hearts, he, he became the musical director of Mary Black's band, right? And he chose all Mary's songs, more or less. And uh, he, he was always in touch with me for songs for Mary to be recording a new record. And indeed, she recorded three of my songs, Past the Point being one, uh, what was the other one? Without the Fanfare was one, uh, The Crusader was one, and that was her very first record. So those songs, like, he was, he was uh, very aware of what I was doing all the time. And when Moving Hearts started, I'd written a song called All I Remember. And he, he felt, he said to Christy, look, Mick has a song that I think would suit the band. So they did a song, All I Remember. And then they brought me on tour with them uh, as, the, as the opening act. And uh, when Christy left, I suppose, uh, it was a natural it's kind natural. of, yeah. Uh, but I, we were we were working really hard at the time, and I, my my own first marriage was breaking up, so I I, I was really under the cosh, and I, I don't think I fronted the band very well. But I did my best, and I was with them for about fourteen months, and we did one live album. Yeah. Yeah. You would have performed in so many places around the country. Mm. Do you have a favourite place in Ireland to perform? Uh, Vicar Street is lovely. Yeah. Uh, it's a lovely modern venue. Um, but I was very fond of places like the Meeting Place in Cork, the Lobby uh, Bar in Cork, all of those little small venues. Yeah. Um, and they're, they're pretty special to play. I'm playing on Friday night now in a place called the Seamus Ennis Centre in Knoll, up outside Dublin. And that's a lovely place to play. Yeah. There's lots of nice places to play. Yeah. And there's been a, a big, uh, since the boom, one thing that can be said for it was there were a lot of art centres opened up, so there are, there are nice venues to play yeah. now. Um, uh, sometimes they're not very well run, but that's, that's another story. Mm -hmm. you know? And do you still get nervous before performances, or is it all...? No. No, no I don't get nervous there. anymore. I, I, I'd get nervous if it were television. Yeah. Uh, television is a kind of an unforgiving medium. Mm -hmm. Radio, you can stop. Say, hold on, we'll, we'll start again, you know. <laughs> Nobody can see your distress, as yeah. it were. But in television, you're exposed to the point of yeah. being pretty naked in front of the camera. So that's a tough one. Uh, so I, I do get nervy about that if it's live. Mm -hmm. A lot of the times, not live. Television is like pre-recorded or whatever, or even the song itself might be just pre-recorded and slotted in as though it were live, you know. Yeah. Um, and that's not too bad. But always when the camera rolls, it's kind of a little unnerving until you get really used to it. The more of it you do, Haley, the better you get. Yeah, the less you don't even know half the time it's there when you, when you do a lot of it. Yeah. And you can see that when like people that are on it all the time, like Gay Bourne or any of those lads, it became second nature to them, you know. So yeah. that helps. The more of it you do, the better, the better yeah. you get. Um, you won three BMI awards for your song, Past the Point of Rescue. Yeah. So what did that mean to you? You must be so proud of that. Absolutely. Song. It's a, it, that's an amazing award to get. For me, for, coming from Limerick, right, to actually get into the Nashville scene by the back door almost, mm -hmm. I mean, was just 
It was uh, like when I at the time I didn't realize the import of it, but now I do. It's very very difficult for people from outside the circle, if you like, um, because a lot of Nashville producers. Now Alan Reynolds, who produced Gar, uh, uh, what's his name, Hal Ketchum's album at the time, and, and Jim Rooney were very open. They were very open people, but normally. Uh, the the, produ the Nashville producer would be very protective, and he would have his his own clique of writers yeah. and and his own musicians, and he mightn't even use the band that Hal would have. He might he'd use he's the musicians that he feels do the business in the studio, and they're different to the people you take on the road. You know, studio musicians are a different kind of animal. Um, but uh, for to to get in there and I might speak about this a bit later at the, at the, the ceremony because I think it's important um, and there's a huge element of luck right a huge element of luck in most of our things that we do in life but like you can actually um, if you like if, how would I put it if you if you have the work done and the luck happens yeah. You're in luck. You're in more yeah. luck than you what thought you were. But if you don't have the work done, like I mean, I happen to be in the right place. I happen to meet um, the girlfriend of a singer, if you like, uh, that was just about to happen and was was. I mean, it, it, there was a lot of a lot of little skittles fell in, in, into place at the same time, and I walked in and I had an album just recorded. So I I'd, I'd done the work. I'd written the song. You can't have the luck without a good song. And it was there, and they went for it. You know, I mean, that was, that's very rare. Mm. Very rare, mm. it really is. And there was a lot of um, head scratching at the time. How did he do that? <laughs> <laughs> so it was very pleasing, yeah. very rewarding, and, and life-changing, you know, it was, because I was, I was really struggling up to then, and, and wasn't sure about, uh, if you like, uh, how real a role a songwriter had. And that, that, put it, that nailed my colours up there. Yeah, this mm -hmm. guy can do it. That was great. It's mm -hmm. like winning an All-Ireland. Yeah. Do you know, that's <laughs> not as good, but it's nearly there. You know, it's, nearly, it's like that. Uh, the minute you, you get that medal, you're sort of saying, mm, I've arrived, you know. Yeah. It's a wonderful thing. Yeah. It's a wonderful thing. Um, you've had such an amazing past and everything up to now, so what sort of stuff can we expect from you for the future? Oh, well, it is a, it's a very strange thing has happened in the last uh, year. I've, 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 I've been more productive for the last year than I have to the five years previous, I have to say. What you can expect is uh, an EP, <laughs> believe it or not, in, uh, hopefully in a April or May, that'll have three big songs. There, the three of them are, I've recorded the three of them already and we're waiting to put the final touches on. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, there are three, I, I was always wanted to write a ballad. Yeah. A big ballad like Lord, Lord uh, Baker or Little Mudsgrave with a human dilemma. So last year I sat down, I gave it a lot of time, and I came up with a song called The Lady Avonlea, which has, I think, 19 verses in it, and is, a, is eight minutes long. Then I wrote another song about uh, an expedition to the Gulf of Carpentaria in 1860 by a guy called O'Hara Burke. He was an Irishman from, from Mayo, and he was half mad, but he, you couldn't doubt his bravery, you know? And then I wrote an immigration song about a memory I had as a child uh, but a family that went to Boston. So those three big songs are there and I've re-recorded a song, or, or recorded a song that uh, again Michal O'Donnell has made, a, made it his own so I didn't do anything to change it called Lord Franklin because I just want something to have on the EP that they might be able to play on radio. Otherwise I won't get, none of the eight minute songs are going to get played, that's for sure. So it's a bit of a, a, bit of a venture and it's commercial suicide but we'll see. I'm hoping to put the Lady Avonlea up on up on YouTube and let people take it yeah. for free. Just just have it. I think it's a great song. Yeah. I really do. Do you want to hear a bit of it? Absolutely. Yeah, I like, I won't play it all. Simply, be, but I'll give you an, an idea of what it's like. Oh, wait, wait a minute now, because I have to tune the guitar really, really out of the a bit 
weirdly for that. So maybe I'll do the other. Will I do the immigration song instead? <laughs> instead, right? This is about a family who lived next to my, to my grandmother and they left one by one and finally uh, there was eight in the family, eight children and they all ended up working for the Edison Light Company in Boston and I was, when I was a child the final, uh, the mother and the father and the last lad who was in school with me at the time, his name was Brandon they, they shut the house uh, and and that was it. They never came home again, ever. So they, that was called an American wake, and the wake word was used because they were dead to us, dead to us as it were. They were gone, mm -hmm. and there was no no coming back. And it was a very sad thing that that, that happened, and it happened all over the country. And and uh, Lord knows it's still happening, you know. But uh, the the finality of their leaving isn't the same as it was then in the nineteen fifties. It was so expensive to come home. So difficult to come back from Australia, so difficult to come back from America. It's not that way anymore, happily. But still, people are shutting home, you know. Anyway, these are, I'll, I'll do a few verses of this and, and see what you like. The story has no home, so I'll tell it here. Before the song, the pressure's born. Severing and loss of faith in the scheme of things of the family next door, the chores of America. Their father was a laboring man, their mother Lily said. She tore the paper off of the wall to light her cigarette. stars and baby John with a restless heart she sighed and lit another one baby John was now a man but still her boy his aunt Bridget paid his passage to Boston town set the dollar home and put a marker down. Rita was the next to run, she threw her smiles my way. I was still a child, but yet I recall the day. Sunday best, the shining boot. They flew like swallows with dreams unfettered to fulfill. But they never flew back here to Patrick's Hill. They never flew back here to Patrick's Hill. Half, okay, <laughs> so and my voice is going, and uh, there's no point in going up with that. Stuff. But that's what it's uh, that's a song about, about them, and uh, hopefully, in time, in April or May, you'll yeah. see the emergency. Okay, lovely. So, well, it's so. a pleasure talking to you. Thank Same you here, Lily, and uh, I'm you know, I'm, I'm delighted to be here, and I hope you enjoyed it. Did very much. All Thanks, right. Thanks, man. Bless you.